The non-farms payroll report for June came out earlier today, and today is Thursday. It normally comes out on the first Friday of the month, but since the first Friday of this month is a federal holiday, they released the data a day early on the holiday-shortened four-day week. And, and first of all, let me wish everybody who listens to my podcast a very, very happy Fourth uh, of July holiday weekend. Unfortunately, we can't really celebrate our independence on July 4th because we live under tyranny, right? We live under the type of tyranny never envisioned by the Founding Fathers. In fact, had the Founding Fathers been able to look forward in time at today's America, they would have stayed with the British. They never would have fought the revolution to gain all the rights that we surrendered so easily over the years because the U.S. government oppresses American citizens in ways King George couldn't have imagined oppressing the colonists. So unfortunately, it's a mixed thing for me when I you know, celebrate the holiday because I love the idea of the 4th of July and the fact that it's a uniquely American holiday. And I really do celebrate what our forefathers did. And this especially was true when I took my son to Washington, D.C. for the first time, and I show him the monuments and all the things that have historic significance about the founding of our country, but knowing how we have basically destroyed all the dreams and all the freedoms that our founding fathers risked their lives and their their fortunes and honors to secure for us. So, you know, it's always mixed emotions on these types of things. But I still enjoy the holiday anyway, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. Hey, also, before I get into the economic data, I want to remind everybody, you know, a lot of people still long for the days of the Peter Schiff radio show when I did two hours of live radio five days a week. And I'm really too busy to do that. But I did decide to go back a little bit into live radio. So those of you who want to hear Peter Schiff on the radio live, you can do it starting tomorrow on the Alex Jones Show. I will be doing the Alex Jones Show on the first and third Friday of every month, which means I'll always be doing the show the day that the non-farm payroll report comes on. I'm doing tomorrow's show. So tomorrow will be the first of this new schedule. But you can you can put it on your calendar. I think I'm going to be doing the second hour of the show. Alex does a three-hour show, and so I'll be joining him for an hour twice a month on the first and third Fridays of every month. And so you can listen live. Uh, you can check for the radio station uh, in your area, but he is nationally syndicated. So I will be on, and I'm not going to stop doing my podcast or my video blogs. That's a little bit extra Peter Schiff that you will be able to listen to uh, on the radio. It's not two hours live every day, but it's better than nothing. Anyway, let us get to the non-farm payroll report. Once again, it is the most anticipated economic release of the month. And the consensus forecast was for 230,000 jobs created. And the actual number ended up being 223,000. So just 7,000 light, right? Not a really bad report. The unemployment rate, uh, which was 5.5% uh, last month, was expected to come in at 5.4. And it came in at 5.3. Right. This is the lowest unemployment rate, I think, in seven years. Right. It's certainly the lowest unemployment rate since President Obama has been president. Right. Oh, this is great news. Right. Uh, uh, not great news. Well, first of all, they ended up revising down the prior two months uh, by about 60,000 jobs. Right. You remember the 280,000 jobs uh, that they reported for May? Well, now they revise that down to just 254,000. So not nearly as strong as they had initially reported. But the devil, again, is always in the details. The worst detail, I think, was the labor force participation rate. That was 62.9 last month. This month, it plunged all the way down to 62.6. This is a new low. It has never hit 62.6 since 1977. Right? Those are, that, that's the middle of the disco craze. 1977. I was in high school. In fact, I think I was still in junior high school in 1977. The last time the labor force participation rate was 62.6. This is the lowest of this so-called recovery. According to the, the government, 432,000 people dropped out of the labor force in June. That's about twice the number of people who got jobs in June. 
And once again, these are low-paying jobs. They are service sector jobs. In fact, I saw a statistic up on Zero Hedge today that mentioned during the entirety of the Obama recovery, we have lost 1.4 million manufacturing jobs, and we have gained 1.4 million waitress, waiter, and bartending jobs, right? Great trade. That is what is going on. But, you know, the household survey was, was even worse because according to the household survey, 640,000 Americans left the labor force in June. And now we have a record 93.6 million Americans no longer in the labor force. And also the household survey reported 349,000 full-time jobs were lost, lost during the month. The only gains were net into part-time. We gained 161,000 part-time jobs. Of course, the difference is still a net loss. So according to the household survey, we lost jobs. But what was important is that we lost the good-paying jobs, and we created the lower-paying jobs. But this labor force participation rate, I was watching on CNBC, the Secretary of Labor, Perez, was interviewed, and he was specifically asked, you know, are you concerned about this big drop in the labor force participation rate? And this is what he said, and I'm not making this up. He said, one month does not a trend maker. So he says, I'm not worried about it because I'm not worried about one month. Well, this is not a one month phenomenon. The labor force participation rate has been going down steadily almost every month, every year uh, that President Obama has been off in office and even before he was sworn in. This is a trend that has been ongoing. I agree. One month does not make a trend. But hundreds of months, how can you uh, you argue that that doesn't make a trend? It is a big trend. But here is another thing that is really important. If you remember, and I pointed this out, when Janet Yellen gave her press conference, following the most dovish meeting that we've had recently when the Fed didn't raise rates, right? Steve Leisman specifically asked Janet Yellen a question, what do we have to see in the labor market before you raise rates? Very specific. And her answer was specific. She said, and I'm almost quoting verbatim, she said, before the Fed can start raising rates, start, she wants to see further improvement in the labor market. Now, at the time, I said, what does she mean? Unemployment is 5.4%. We've been creating 200,000 jobs a month. What more improvement does she want? Well, she was specific. She addressed two concerns that she had. One was the labor force participation rate that too many people had left the labor force, and so she wants to see them coming back in. And she also mentioned the proliferation of people working part-time who really want to work full-time, and they're settling for a part-time job. So she wants to see a change in that trend as well. Well, based on this data, we've just moved a lot further from her goal. The labor force participation rate has never been lower, and we're creating all kinds of part-time jobs, and we're losing full-time jobs. So we are moving away from the Fed's goal. So based on what Janet Yellen just said, how can the Fed begin to raise interest rates when all of the measures of the labor force are moving away from her objective? The labor force is getting weaker. It doesn't matter that the unemployment rate moved down to 5.3 because Janet Yellen already mentioned that the unemployment rate does not tell the true story. And of course, why did the unemployment rate fall? It wasn't because we created 220,000 jobs. It was because 600,000 people left the labor force and stopped looking. Those people are still unemployed. They don't have jobs, but they're not counted as being unemployed because officially they're not in the labor market. But I mean, what are these people doing? They're not old people. This is not the octogenarians or 60, 70 year olds retiring. These are 20 and 30 year old guys leaving the labor force. They're not retiring. You find some guy who's 25 years old and he's living in his mother's basement. And you say, hey, what, what, you know, what do you do for a living? He says, well, I'm retired. You can't retire. Retired from what? You have to have a career before you can retire. You see, that's the new America. You skip the career and you go right from college to retirement. What are you retiring from? Partying? So obviously these kids that don't have jobs and who are leaving the labor force, they are not retired. They are unemployed. They just don't count as being unemployed. And I think Janet Yellen knows that. That's why they're not going to raise interest rates. Also, look at the average hourly earnings. There we were supposed to have an increase of 0.2. It came out at zero, flat, 
no increase in wages. And in fact, to add insult to injury, everybody was excited about the 0.3 increase we got last month because it beat the estimate. Well, they revised that down to 0.2. So now it didn't beat the, beat the estimate. And this gain, instead of gaining, building on that increase of 0.2 or 0.3, like they expected, they expected a 2% gain on top of the 0.3 or 0.2 on top of the 0.3. Instead, we took the 0.3 down to 0.2 and got no gain from that at all. So very weak number on earnings, on labor force participation, a weak employment number, even if the top line number is higher than expected. Also, on the unemployment claims, the weekly jobless claims did come out today, and they were looking for 270,000. We got 281,000. So we got 11,000 more claims than had been expected. So that number weakening. And again, I think this number is going to go a lot higher. I mean, you look at a lot of the other reports that have come out that bear on the, the labor sector. And to me, it looks like there's a lot of layoffs in the wings waiting to happen. It's just that a lot of employers have been holding on to their workers waiting for this recovery that's not materializing. And so they're going to get tired of waiting, and they're going to start laying people off. You can already see that in the inventories. All these companies have bought up all these inventories, and now they're stuck with a bunch of inventory that they, their customers are too broke to buy. Because Americans spent all their money in the past. They borrowed a bunch of money to buy stuff in the past. They got nothing left to buy stuff now. They got to pay the bills on their past consumption. Plus, they have low-paying jobs where they have no-paying jobs. So, But businesses made bad bets on inventory that you know their customers can't afford. So these layoffs are coming. And I mentioned before, one of the reasons that there haven't been that many layoffs is because there haven't been that many hires, right? Normally, higher layoffs and higher hires go hand in hand, right? Because you have to hire people to replace the people that you fire. And when you hire people, they don't always work out. So you got to fire them and hire new guys. So you'd, a, a strong labor market, there'd be lots of people getting hired and getting fired. The fact that we're not getting a lot of people fired is probably evidence that a lot of these jobs don't exist. They were just made up. Right. They, they just ex assume that they were created based on the on the birth death model. Now, the the jobs numbers were not the only uh, economic number of the day. Another important number that came out was factory orders. Now, factory orders have actually been down for eight of the last nine months. I mean, this is unheard of, except now that we got the maze number. Now we're down nine out of the last 10 months. And he, here's the numbers they were looking for. Minus 0.3% in factory orders for May. Instead of minus 0.3, we got minus 1% even. Big drop, right? More than three times the estimate. But it gets worse because April was originally reported as minus 0.4. So they thought that we would have a minus 0.3 drop from the minus 0.4. Instead, they revised April down to minus 0.7. So we actually fell 1% from a downwardly revised 0.7%. So it is a disaster of a number for factory orders. Now, the factory orders have been so bad. In fact, year over year, if you look at the decline in, in factory orders, they're down 6.3%. And that's the adjusted number. The, the non-adjusted number, it's an 8% drop. But this is the biggest yearly drop, year over year drop, since the 2008 financial crisis, and we haven't even had a financial crisis. I mean, we're, these numbers are so weak, right? The only time we've ever seen factory orders this week is during a recession. So the fact that it's happening now and we're not in a recession, this is, this is an anomaly. In fact, there are so many data points that have been coming out that the only time you see data this bad is during a recession. Yet supposedly the economy is so great that the Fed can finally raise interest rates after keeping interest rates at zero for almost seven years, when by most measures, the economy is as bad as it's been in the last seven years. In fact, I think just on most of the numbers, the economy is in worse shape now than when the Fed launched QE1 or QE3. The only measure, I think, where the economy is in better shape is on the official unemployment rate, which we know means nothing. And maybe the housing market has picked up a little bit, but that's just a dead cat balance. I mean, and the fact that housing prices are going up, that's not even a good thing. We need housing prices to go down. Meanwhile, we didn't get many construction jobs uh, in this jobs report anyway. Very few factory jobs. And again, mostly part-time, temporary, low-paying, the same type of bullshit jobs uh, that we've been creating all along. And if Janet Yellen is looking for better jobs, higher-paying jobs, full-time jobs, 
She's got a long time to look. So by her own criteria, there's no reason to raise interest rates. Yet the markets really did not react to this. I mean, the dollar was a little bit softer on the day, but not much. Gold wasn't even positive. And even though it's well below 1,200 again, like 11, the 1160s, I mean, gold's gotten hammered. It couldn't even rally on this bad news. And it just shows you how clueless people are. They're still clinging to this narrative, you know, that the Fed is going to raise rates and that the U.S. economy is in good shape. I mean, what does it take for this narrative to die? How long do people have to see this information that proves they're wrong before they finally admit that they're wrong? Interestingly, on this vein, I read this article that was on The Motley Fool. And the title of it is The Root of Our Problems. And it talks about being right for the wrong reason. And the example it gives is me. Right. It says, you know, hey, here's Peter Schiff, who claims he predicted the 2008 financial crisis or the collapse of the housing bubble. And he was right, but he was right for the wrong reason. And he, they say that that's even worse than being wrong. And what they say is they, they put a quote that I made where I said, quote, interest rates are one of the problems for the housing market and they're going a lot higher. And so they say at the time I said that the yield on the 10 year Treasury was at 4.7. And now it's it, six years later, it got to an all time low of 1.5. Therefore, I was wrong. I predicted higher interest rates and I was wrong. And I thought that what would burst the housing bubble was higher interest rates. And because we didn't get higher interest rates, but the housing bubble just happened to burst anyway. Well, I was right for the wrong reasons, which means I was it was worse than being wrong. So all the guys, so the Mike Normans and whoever that guy's name was with the long hair that said prices are going to go up about 10%, I was more wrong than them. The guys that thought housing prices would never fall, I was more wrong than they were because I thought prices would go down for the wrong reason, which is wrong, which shows you that the biggest fools at the Motley Fool are the people who write that. I mean, first of all, when I said interest rates were going to go up and that was going to be one of the problems or one of the reasons that the housing bubble was going to prick, I was right. Interest rates did go up. They went up for two years following that particular quote. Interest rates didn't start to go down until after the bubble burst. So interest rates were rising. The Fed raised interest rates from 1% to five and a half percent. That is a big increase in interest rates. And of course, when I was talking about rising interest rates with respect to housing, I was referring to the interest on a mortgage, mortgage rates. And mortgage rates went up, especially for people who had adjustable rate mortgages or teaser rates. And I was specific about that. So they can pull one little quote about me saying interest rates are going to go up and say, well, Six years later, they were down. Well, what about what happened in the interim period? But of course, to say that I was right for the wrong reasons means that you have no idea what I said or wrote. I would challenge anybody to read my 2007 book, Crash Proof, or to read the dozens of articles that I wrote and published on my website and all over the Internet about the real estate bubble between 2004 and 2007 and tell me I was right for the wrong reasons. Not only was I right for the right reasons, I got every single reason. I nailed them all. The housing bubble burst for precisely the reasons that I thought it would. The one thing I got wrong is I thought that after the housing bubble burst, the dollar would go down. Instead, it went up because by the time that the housing bubble burst, the dollar was already at an all-time record low. I started warning people about the housing bubble when the dollar index was probably 85, 90. I forget where it was when I really started talking about the housing bubble. By the time it burst, the dollar index was down to 71. So it ended up rallying when the bubble burst. But that was after the fact. But as far as what would cause the housing bubble to burst, I wasn't right for the wrong reasons. I was right for the right reasons. But why do these guys at the Motley Fool want to try to pretend that I was wrong? Because they never want to give me credit for being right, because if they give me credit for having been right back then, well, then how do they ignore what I'm saying now? The only way the mainstream media can ignore what I have to say is to undermine my credibility by trying to pretend that not only did I not understand the housing bubble, but that I was actually more wrong than most people who didn't understand it. Because I said that the housing bubble would burst because of rising interest rates. That's not what I said. Even their own quote, they quote me as saying one problem for the housing market. Well, what about all the other problems? I only said it was one problem. And I was specific. It was rising mortgage rates. And in, in particular, the subprime, which was all adjustable rate. 
teaser rates, all that stuff. And lots of people, one of the main reasons that so many people mailed in their keys instead of their checks was because their rates adjusted. The interest on their mortgage went up, and because the interest rate was higher, they couldn't afford to pay. That was integral to my explanation. But obviously, these guys really didn't read anything that I wrote. Or just go and watch the Mortgage Bankers YouTube video. Watch that video and then tell me I was right for the wrong reasons. It is impossible. Yes, I did predict higher interest rates ultimately. That hasn't happened yet as far as the Treasury market is. But that is going to happen. One of these days, interest rates are going to skyrocket. That's probably going to be my last forecast to come true. We'll probably have a dollar crisis before. So the dollar will probably collapse, and then that will send interest rates soaring. And the fact that we've delayed the day of reckoning for so long is going to mean that we have that much more to reckon with when that day ultimately arrives. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.